Hi, everybody. Welcome to another talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I am one of your hosts, Noor Kyle, along with the other one of your hosts, Mushtaq Ali. Yeah. And if you've been following along with us for the past couple of weeks, we're doing this three parter on the Enneagram of process. So this is kind of like a something we consider really useful in our teaching and what we're going to be talking specifically about tonight is the Enneagram of the work as we call it. Do we want to do a little spiel before we get into it? Yeah, we probably should. Shall I? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me get myself in focus here. Hello, hello. Here I am. I'm still not in focus, but that may be me rather than the camera. I could be slightly out of phase today. So here we are. And if you're walking, watching this, walking this, if you're watching this on YouTube, welcome. If it's your first time, we would like to invite you to go down here and press the subscribe button and hit that bell so that you can be notified when we put up our incredibly amusing and valuable uh, videos, which we'll do at least once a week. And if you're not new and you haven't subscribed, we're wondering why do you hate us? If you hate us, that's all right, but you should subscribe so you know when to hate us. Um, and uh, we love your feedback. So please, please, please leave comments. If you like it, hit the like button. If you hate it, hit the hate button. It's all good. It's all feedback. And we value your feedback. Um, and we especially value your comments because it guides us in what we do next. Oftentimes, our friend here, Jonathan, has... Uh, given me a number of ideas of things that I want to talk about just by commenting on our previous videos. And mm -hmm. we love that. Yeah, sometimes things come up in conversation with one on one students or in our group sessions. So we always take an interest in what people have to say. So thanks for that. So this is also the end of the year. And we would like to invite each and every one of you Everyone who is watching, listening, thinking about watching, has never heard of us before, we don't care, to think about making a donation to the Nine-Sided Circle School because we this next year we're going to have some huge expenses coming up. And while we will shoulder the weight ourselves, any ounce of weight that we don't have to shoulder is greatly appreciated. So in the description below, you will see a place where you could just hit that little link and make a donation, which is not tax deductible because we are not a nonprofit. Uh, but it is greatly appreciated and we will use that money to make this channel better, to make our material more accessible to more people. And at this moment, we survive on your donations. We are not charging money for anything, especially during the plague times, because so many people are out of work. We don't want to overburden you. All true. So there's that, there's my pitch. Yeah. And of course, you know, there is also the fact that we do one on one sessions, those we do for a reasonable, you know, yeah, very exchange. Reasonable Cheaper than a psychiatrist. Yeah. And we like to think we do good work. Mushtaq and I are both, as we have been told, at least useful people to be in touch We're with. kind of fun. Yeah. This would be the point where somebody like, say, John could give us a uh, spontaneous unsolicited tes testimony. Oh, my gosh. Putting people on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> we do that, though. We do that. <laughs> I'm teasing John because John has John and I have been hanging out since like 1999 or something, uh, and he's still not enlightened. So I don't know. What yeah, I'm I'm still here. If that tells you anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, with all that said, today we are going to be talking about the enneagram of the work. So, where do we want to start? We want to start with. What is the work? Now, not all of what appear to be spiritual paths are the work. 
the work is a very specific line of inquiry. So if you go to some, um, I, there was this, this one guru I remember in India, he was all about the holy ashes being manifest and everybody following him and doing bhakti yoga for him and all of that kind of stuff. That's not the work. The Sufi teachers that tell you, oh, you must obey me. I am the master. I am the enlightened master and you must obey me and just follow me and do whatever I say and never ask questions and be in service to me. That's not the work. Um, the guys who say you have to say the magic words and join our fan club, which is a religion of some sort. And then God will save you, whereas he's going to destroy everybody else or punish them for eternity. That's not the work. There are many more things that are not the work than are the work. The work is the process of moving into human adulthood and then moving into um, abiding awakeness, to be awake, to be deconditioned. That's the work. And the work does not require, sad to say, because I could actually use some flunkies, but the work does not require that you be anybody's flunky. As a matter of fact, it kind of insists that you don't. Yep, no flunkies. No flunkies. And when it comes down to it, there are not that many people who do, who teach the work. And that's okay, because people get to do whatever they want. You want cosmic consciousness? There are people out there teaching you how to achieve cosmic consciousness. You want uh, unity consciousness? There are people out there who teach you that. But there are not that many people out there who teach you how to be awake. That reminds me, uh, an, another exciting thing is that one of the people who does teach you how to be awake, I have been coaxing out of retirement now with the, the help of uh, my friends Dave and Cherie, and they will soon be teaching. And you'll hear all about this there, or you'll hear all about that here, or something like that. And there will be one more person who has a perspective on how to actually do the work. So it's not just us. He teaches from a completely different point of view. He's, he's way more Zen, which means he gets to hit you with a stick, whereas we don't. It's very sad for us, not for him. He enjoys it. But the work is out there. There are people who do it, but not everything that you find is the work. And the work follows a very specific pattern that we can know. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Well, let's let's say what what do we mean when we say the work? Let's unpack that a little bit. That's the thing. Yeah. The work is first of all, more than anything else, moving towards human adulthood. One of the things that we know, and I should have probably thought about doing the Enneagram of human adulthood, but I haven't, so we'll save that for later. But most, most people, most of the time, are not adults. That guy walking down the street, he's not 40 years old. He's a 14-year-old with 40 years worth of experience. Think about that. The woman who is throwing a tantrum in a store because she's not allowed to go into the store without a mask is not an adult human being. She is a child. We stop developing naturally, spontaneously around puberty. Sometimes before that, because a lot of people are actually, you know, They've been 10 year olds for 50 years. And it doesn't have to be this way. This goes there. 
one of the earliest videos that we we did and i'll put something probably up here and at the end of this to this talk was on on wolves and on uh, how wolves become adult and how people used to become adult and i'll put that up there so that you can review it and i don't have to talk about it twice um but human beings are designed to become adults, but we have stopped. And the reason that we have stopped is because we have been domesticated. A domesticated animal is one where juvenile traits have been bred into them so that they continue into adulthood. The difference between a dog and a wolf is a dog is a wolf that has never grown up. The behavior of dogs and wolves are identical for the first year of their life. And then at, at about 18 months, the wolf's behavior changes and the wolf becomes an adult and the dog never does. So the dog continues to be imprinted on what it perceives of as its parent. You have cattle. Oh, I must have offended somebody. That's okay. We love that. You look at domesticated cattle, uh, even the bulls. So you have a Hereford bull that's being brought in to breed the cows. And it's this big, chunky brown, brown guy. And the, the humans are just moving him along and poking him with sticks sometimes. And he's like, eh, just give me the women, right? You get a real cow, a real bull. And, and Noor knows that I love watching wild cattle. Oh yeah, the YouTube. Uh, yeah, it's, so. It's all bull videos. <laughs> no, it's not all bull videos, but I love to watch like um, Iberian cattle which are completely wild and not bred to be fat and stupid. They are strong and smart and fast and agile and very aggressive and really scary. And they think that the hairless monkeys are stupid and should be stomped into little bloody puddles. There is a clear difference between the two. I mean, yeah. I don't know much about breeding cattle but i definitely see that there is even a cognitive difference between the two in yeah. a sense there's just this sharpness to these bulls that are they're they're sleeker they're sharper they're more attuned to their environment and whereas the more domesticated cattle are just they're not really interested in their surroundings so much as they're interested in in breeding and they are beefy and definitely built for consumption, perhaps, rather yeah, and than... And they don't know how to get their own food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, wild Iberian bulls have never been fed on silage. Not once in their entire lives. They live off the land, and that's it. Which is one reason they're so healthy. Um, anyway... That's an example of the difference between a wild and a domesticated animal. There used to be wild humans. There are still a few, but very, very few. The domesticated humans have basically wiped the wild humans out. And the thing is though, you know what's funny about cats? Well, there's a lot funny about cats, just look at the internet. But the funniest thing about cats is that cats domesticated themselves. We didn't go out and start breeding cats to be our friends. The cats moved in on us because they realized that it was a soft, cushy thing to just catch mice in the granary and hang out and have, have people pet them. Because of this, cats are completely capable of going feral at any point in their lives. From what I've heard, this is not true. What? From what I've heard, this is not true. A domesticated cats don't necessarily know how to manage. I mean, cats that have spent their lives indoors. A specific cat doesn't know how to manage. Domesticated mm -hmm. cats know how to manage. This is true. There is scientific data to back this up. This is not 
an area of contention within science. I'll check. You can check. And you will find that while some fat, lazy cat might not be able to do well on its own, a lot of them do. And I'm not talking about a specific cat. I'm talking about Felis domesticus, the, the common house cat in general. And we can see that they are perfectly capable of going feral just by looking around our own neighborhoods. At least here, there are plenty of feral cats around here. Uh, the, I think the animal that's really not domesticated is the pig. Is the what? Pig. Um, you might have a point there. A lot of pigs are very, very capable of going feral. We know that up here just by going into the Marin watershed because there are feral pigs all over the place up there. And it's the same sort of thing. Cool, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, there is only one native breed of pig in the United States and that's the javelina. All other pigs that you find in the, the wild are all brought in from Europe. And they do well here and they do well when they escape from their pens and go wild. So that's two example, cats and pigs. But cats domesticated themselves. I don't know that pigs did. I think that we domesticated pigs. So there you go. Yeah. So we domesticated ourselves. Human beings are self-domesticated. No other species came in and went, oh, we're going to breed neotenous traits into you. We did that. And because of that, like cats in general, we have the ability to go feral again. And in a certain sense, the move to human adulthood is a return to the feral. It's a return to the wild. And I know that some of you like uh, Dave are, um, have been putting a lot of energy into the whole idea of rewilding, which is a very good thing. The big thing about uh, an undomesticated human is that they can do a couple of things that a domesticated human can't do or won't do. And that is they can uh, comprehend the results of their own behaviors. If a domesticated human has a desire, they will act on that desire even if the long-term outcome of that is negative, something that they don't want. An adult human being will suppress that until it is safe to act on the desire. Or if it's never safe, they just won't do it because they can see the outcomes of their behavior. Feral humans have empathy to a much greater extent than domesticated humans. That seems weird, but uh, it is the case. Feral humans also have a sense of personal responsibility. And I, I experienced this in watching uh, our own feral human population. Um, even though it's in remnants and, and tatters now, which is Native American peoples. One of the big problems with Native American peoples and Europeans meeting on this con con continent is that Native, most of the Native Americans were not domesticated. You know how you can tell if a human being is domesticated? There's a very simple way. Do they have the concept of kingship? Is there a idea that there is a, a divine right of some person to control other people? And that person will act as 
a, a so-called alpha male and boss everybody else around and people will naturally unconsciously obey that person. That is a sign of a domesticated um, culture. Okay, somebody argue with me about that. Come on, you can do it. Well, this might be a little sideways, but um, the more urbanized um, Native Americans, the Incas and the Mayans, would they be domesticated? Oftentimes, yeah, because they had kings. They had these rulers who they obeyed. Domestication is like uh, COVID-19. It spread throughout the human population, starting in China and India and the, the Middle East and spread outwards. And I consider it a, a disease myself. And it happened around the time that agriculture showed up. And if you look at um, like the Incas and the, the Mayans, the Aztecs, they were all heavily agrarian cultures. And the thing about agriculture is that you need to have slaves to work the land. Think about that. Same people in those times, I mean, you go up to some hunter gatherer and say, all right, I want you and your family to camp here forever. And your job is to plant these plants, then harvest them, protect them from all other comers, protect this land, don't let anybody else come on it. And then when all of the food is ready, give it to me. What is any hunter gatherer going to tell you? It's going to tell you, bye. See ya, and I wouldn't want to be ya. We went from a, I mean, yes, hunter-gatherers had their challenges. Uh, infant mortality was very high, but if you survived infancy, you would probably live into your 50s, 60s, or 70s. Um, at least your 50s and 60s. There are a few incidences of 70s. Instead of working 10 hours a week to gather food and hunt food, you would work 10 hours a day on your crops. Think about that. Instead of going from a varied, diverse diet, which included a number of plants and animals that was high in protein and high in fat in most cases, uh, and very high in fiber, you went to a monocrop, right? You went to wheat and onions. Blech. Potatoes. Yeah, potatoes came a lot later, but yeah, the <laughs> potatoes are, are, are actually a Native American crop, mm. uh, but they were a staple uh, at one time in South America. That's where they come from. You know, here we had corn, but even when people grew corn, they still relied on hunting and gathering to a great extent. And they never used corn as a monocrop. We had what were called the three sisters, which were corn and beans and squash, which they would grow together. And they knew how to prepare the corn so that the food, the, the nutrients in it were bioavailable which white people didn't know, which is why in the 19th century, we had epidemics of pellagra in the South. But anyway, so. So anyway, we have a comment from uh, John Hurley. He yeah. says, not many kings left. The concept in that sense is largely gone. Yeah, you seen Washington lately? You think Trump is not a king? I mean, he doesn't have a crown yet, but his followers treat him in the same way that a medieval or uh, ancient king was treated. They obey him. 
they look to him as uh, their father figure. They I are, think that may they, go for uh, almost any political figure. The fact that we give them that authority, we hand to them that sense of uh, being the parent, being the nation's parent. Yeah. So in adult cultures, you still have leaders. Um, this was one of the things that, that happened in the Old West. The Americans would ride in and they would go up to an Apache camp and they would say, we want to speak with your chief. And whatever Apache they were talking to would point to some guy and uh, the soldiers would go over to that guy and say, we want to make a treaty with you. And the guy says, yeah, sure, it sounds good. And he, he makes a treaty with them. And then three weeks later, the soldiers are back saying, you're not keeping your treaty. And, you, and the guy says, of course I'm keeping my treaty. I haven't, I haven't done any of the things that I said I wouldn't do. But these other people have. And he says, they never made a treaty with you. You see the difference in that? A leader amongst the Apaches was a leader because he did good things. He took care of everyone around him. He had much compassion and he led people without making mistakes. If he tried to be a king in the European sense, what would happen is he would wake up one morning and the rest of the camp would be gone. They would just have left him in the night or they would drive him out because they never put up with that kind of bullshit. So from Jonathan, we have, are you saying that suffering hardship and uncertainty are necessary to grow up? I don't know that it's necessary, but it certainly helps. It depends on your reaction to it or your response to it. Hardship and uncertainty are a part of life. What do you do with it? Yeah, and Palon says, not just kings, but modern leaders, quote unquote, yeah. who are bosses. So yeah, people yeah. who tell you what to do in a top-down sort of, you don't have to think, I'm gonna think for you sort of way. Yeah, and that you find that everywhere. You know, Mount Zedong was a king. Paul Pot was a king. Um, Donald Trump is a king. And they demand um, the same kind of servitude as every other king has ever done. Would the modern idea of uh, patriotism be a slightly more abstract version of the problem? Yeah, because patriotism so is defined as a, a form of absolutism, like my country, right or wrong. That was popular when I was a kid. Or America, love it or leave it. Mm -hmm. Where love it is defined as obey the authorities. See, I was always my country right or not at all. And that was not a very popular idea when I was a kid. Yeah, I think the original version of the quote was something like, if not right to be set right. Yeah, and that's not what they were talking about. I refuse for my country to be wrong if I can do anything about it. So here's the milieu in which uh, the work exists. So what I'm going to do here is pull up the Enneagram of the work, and we're going to talk about it. Let me know when you can all see this. There. Yep, got it. OK. So, human adulthood, coming to human adulthood, moving from the larval state through the pupil state into the adult state is, I mean, it makes us sound like insects, but there ain't that much difference, um, is buried within this, uh, but we don't have time to discuss that tonight. So, up here at zero and nine, Somebody has 
an experience of awakening or an experience of the possibility of awakening. And probably everybody who has joined us tonight has had this experience in some form or another, probably more than once. But it's that thing that sets you, it, it gets you to ask the hard questions, the questions that get you into trouble oftentimes. When you have that, you go to one right here. One is the knowledge of a possibility and the gathering of information on how to do it. You start reading books, you start watching videos on YouTube because you, as you know, everything can be found on YouTube. All the knowledge in the universe could be found here if you knew the right search parameters. So you read books. Are people relating to this so far? You, you, do you understand? zero and one if anyone has any questions yeah feel free to speak yeah, up just like jump in this is not me front loading my knowledge into you or nor trying to hold me back <laughs> yeah sure i'm i'm watching your face you don't have anything to say okay she's good um yeah so you gather knowledge, you gather information, you read books, you go to seminars, you listen to people, and you find something that resonates with you. Within that something that resonates with you, there will be practices. Maybe you're reading a book, uh, you're, you know, you're reading Zen Without Zen Masters or something like that, or um, any book that will give you some things to do. Somebody in the book says, Okay, just sit and breathe and watch what your consciousness does. That's a practice. So you found one. Or somebody at some talk, uh, you know, you go to an Adya Shanti talk and he says, let everything be as it already is. And you go, what? And then you try. Now, most people are going to be stuck in between one and two over and over again. Yep. Yeah. You've all seen this. Or been there. Or been there. And I will tell you, and there will be um, something to show you that the traps in the work. Uh, I did a video with Noor on this, or Noor did a video with me on this, actually, uh, <laughs> some time back. And I will put it up here so that you guys can find it. Uh, because that's where those come in. So the hunt the guru trap is a, is a big one right here, where you find somebody, you find this great teacher and you hang out with them for a week or a month or a year, and then you're on to the next one. Following the shiny syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. And that will happen until you get through the shock at three. The shock is intention and commitment to the work. This may involve finding a living teacher that uh, you can uh, relate to and making a commitment to work with them. But it's not just that. This is your commitment to find the awake state no matter what. It's enlightenment or bust. It is... Um, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to know the truth. That happens here at three. Your intention and commitment are what get you through here. Now, if you make that, you get to point four. We call point four the honeymoon. And changes begin here. Uh, if you found a living teacher, and living teachers are very important, dead teachers are of very little use. And the reason for that is that a dead teacher cannot tell you when you are bullshitting yourself. Whereas that is one of the primary functions of a living teacher. They will say, you know, you just told me this thing and you're bullshitting yourself and you need to look at that. I can tell you that I have heard some form of that 
uh, over and over again for a good chunk of my life. And that's because I had really good teachers. Mm -hmm. And I have heard the same thing. And I have said the same thing to others. And yes. I'm sure that many of us have had the same experience. So with a living teacher, it's much easier. You can do this all on your own. Don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that you can't, but it becomes more difficult. It is a matter of degree. So. So I just want to touch into the chat. Uh, Shuri says tire kicking. I think that was in response to being oh, yeah. stuck between one and two. That's definitely one of the things, tire kicking. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. What does that mean? That's like when you go to buy a car, you kick the tires. <laughs> yeah that's where that phrase comes from <laughs> all right yeah nice okay and then from mr keen we have a question yes. do you, how do you explain for example about four that is connected to one and two uh we okay, will, so we'll get to we, that yes yeah. we'll follow up on that no worries and then John Hurley asks, how is three from the outside? Seems like in this, it is coming from within. Three is coming from within always. Even if there is a commitment to an outside school or teacher that actually is worth your time, it always comes from the inside. Nobody can make this for you. Nobody can set your intention for you. And if they try, you need to get away from them as fast as possible because they are bad, evil, no good people. Never let somebody take away your ability to intend for yourself or commit for yourself. So at four, changes begin. And what that looks like is you begin doing the practices of whatever part of the school you've gotten into. And when you do, the surface crud begins to get scraped off. And you get more energy and it feels good and you feel like you're making progress and things that have been troubling to you for maybe years vanish because you are deconditioning your ego. The thing to remember is at this point, you're, you're scraping through the surface stuff. Then you get to the equator, that point where you're moving from four to five and it goes from just surface conscious things, things that you have easy access to, to the dark night of the soul at five. Five is where the real work takes place. This is where you begin to take the energy back from your samskara. Samskara is a Sanskrit word, which I usually translate as subliminal memory traces, subliminal programming. Um, the Yoga Sutras say that it can go back many incarnations. I don't know about that, but it can certainly go back this incarnation and it's stuff below the surface that you don't have conscious access to that you must work to bring to conscious attention so that you can deal with it and this is the real process of the work this yep. is the process of breaking the conditioning one pattern at a time and typically it's stuff that you may have a hard time seeing in yourself or it coming to accept about yourself. That's part of the task. And you have a hard time dealing with it when it comes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be terrifying. It can really shake you up, make you have a bad day, bad month, bad year, depending on how difficult it's becoming to work through that ship. Yeah, one guy I know describes this part of the process as spiritual autolysis, which is you're eating your own ego. And it, it is kind of that. When you go as far as you can with that, and this is where um, the law of due diligence comes in. Here is where you're doing your due diligence. If you don't know about that, I did talk. I was going to say, on that. Again, link to that as well. <laughs> yeah. 
there will be links everywhere. So you do the suffering here. At a certain point, you come to the place where you have to surrender. That's the sick shock. The sick shock is a matter of opening yourself to the grace of the universe. And it's a real thing. And when you can get out of your own way and do that, the universe gives you the energy required to get past this shock. When you get past this shock, you, you move from 0.6 to 0.7 which is the experience of the unconditioned self. Mm, juicy. So yes. Mr. Keem has a question. Yes. Mr. Keem asks, why is six opening to grace connecting to the universal energy? Could it be something else or some other energy? No. There are a lot of ways to put this, um, but it's always this thing and nothing else. It's surrendering to God. It and, is submitting yeah. to the will of the universe. This is where you become a Muslim. <laughs> Muslim means submission. And it also means peace. By surrendering to the will of the universe, you open yourself up to the grace of the universe. And that may not be a popular point of view, but it is a true one for the work. There is always the point where you surrender. Now, you don't have to join a religion. You don't have to believe in a God with three eyes and white, long, flowing hair or uh, some mean guy on a cloud or some happy guy with flowers. You just have to know that there is that which is universal and greater than yourself that you are a part of and you can open yourself up to that. That's the secret here. That energy that you receive, which is what we call grace, is the energy that allows you to finally break your own conditioning and get to the unconditioned self. The unconditioned self brings you to non-dual awareness. And then you're back at nine. And you have the experience of awakening, which is not an accident. Now, that's the path around the circle. Then there so are what the happens for the person going around the circle at that point? Um, nine is a new octave. Yep. Yeah. But there is something else that happens, but we only see that from the center. Mm -hmm. So we have a comment from Ilmar. Yes. So how is the surrendering to the universal energy different from surrendering to Trump? Wow. Mm. Um, the universal energy doesn't tell you that you have to believe anything. It doesn't make any demands of you like, oh, you must uh, wear this stupid red hat. It is not ego oriented. Yes. No. Surrendering to Trump is saying that your ego is greater than mine, therefore my ego will follow your ego. This has I would, Yeah, I my would say at point six, yeah. this is the process of the ego falling away. So that means you are not submitting to ego. You are not submitting to your own or anyone else's. Yeah, that's a damn good question, though, because that's yes. a distinction that needs to be made. Yeah, and I agree. And so he elaborates. So does universal energy not ask anything of you? Um, as far as I can tell, the only thing that it asks of you is to be awake to it. You know, I've been hanging out with, with, with connections to the universal energy for some years now, and it's never wanted me to 
do any particular thing. It's allowed me to just follow my own will in these things, uh, which is kind of nice. You know, when somebody hands you a list of rules, like, um, here are all, all of these laws. These are God's laws and you must follow them. You have to wear your hair a certain way. You have to put uh, your right shoe on every morning before you put your left shoe on. You have to wash your hands five times a day, which is not a bad idea. I highly recommend that. But, um, you know, you can't eat these foods and you must eat these foods. But if you eat these foods, you cannot combine them together. You can't wear clothing that are made of two different fibers, you know, all of this stuff. This is not universal will, no matter what they tell you. The universal, the, the infinite being of the universe does not care if you wear a Lindsay Woolsey shirt. It just doesn't care. Does it care if you commit murder? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that if I ever kill somebody who doesn't need it. Okay. Usually, my experience is that you don't commit murder because you have too much empathy. Mm -hmm. You might defend yourself or your own. Somebody might die in the process of doing that, but it won't be because you don't recognize them as part of the whole and you just end them because you can. Uh huh. Really? So. Somebody burst through my door and they're going to hurt Noor or myself and I'll put a bullet through their face. But I'm not going to walk down the street and find them and do that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering about the relationship between this and some of the rules and religions are actually sensible rules. Yeah. But presumably you follow them for different reasons. Yeah. I mean, not, uh, not committing murder is a great idea not coveting what other people have not coveting anything is necessary to the path uh, but you can't impose that on a child you can't tell a child to uh, do not cover your friend's lollipop because they don't how to know how to not do that that's an adult behavior. That's not a childish behavior. So we, yes. we have a couple other thoughts. Um, uh, I, will, I will go back to Ms. Dekim's question, but Ilmar follows up and asks, is uh, universal energy a quote unquote person with intentions, beliefs, desires, no i do not experience it as that it's more to, to me to try and put it into words which i don't think that you can su successfully do um, it is like all consciousness of all life in the entire universe at its base collective level it is it is not a personification in my experience i mean somebody else might you know, you ask Rumi, and he might experience this as the beloved, as a person. But I don't think that he ever personified the beloved, except in terms of Shamsi Tabriz. Um, this is why it's so hard to talk about this yeah, stuff. But I don't, I don't experience it as a, an individual or a person or anything like that. I, mean, I don't experience it as anthropomorphic in any way means or form you could jokingly call it the force even yes you could call it the force it's that's not exactly the right word no <laughs> seem to have the kind of uh beingness that this has there is a beingness there a sense of universal beingness yes. um so from sheree is this the same thing as being in line with the will of God or kinda, the universal kinda. energy? I mean, this uh, is except kind of that the will of God is so abused. 
I mean, every preacher will tell you that what he wants you to do is the will of God, and it's part of God's plan. Anytime I hear of anybody talking about God's plan, I run, because those people are nuts. Why would God need a plan? God doesn't need a plan. So, yes, it is God's will, and God doesn't will to anything. God just has will. I know that they're going to come and burn me as a heretic any, any minute now. But <laughs> what can you do? So let's talk about the moving lines, unless there are more questions. Nor? Uh, I mean, Mr. Keene asks, any way to know where we are in this cycle? And I was thinking either we would... Uh, come around to that naturally or your teacher will tell you if you need to know yeah yeah one of the things that my first sufi sheikh said to me is do not pay attention to your own state or station or to the state or station of anybody else do not discuss it with them do not inquire of them as to their station uh, do not tell them what you think your station is. That's all ego. If I think you need to know, I will tell you. If I don't tell you, you don't need to know. Just do the work. And that was some of the best advice I ever got. Because trying to pay attention to where you are on the path is kind of egoic. You know, just do the work. Are you awake? What is true right now? What is true? Are you awake right now? That's all you need to attend to. So the moving lines, and this will help answer Mustakim's previous question. Here's the teacher. And the teacher may be a person or it may be the universal being, whatever. I'm going to assume that it's probably a person because it's so much easier to do the path if you find somebody who can guide you on this, who is not a total asshole. Uh, and they look at you and they go, oh, here he is. And he's going to move to point one. And when this person, he or she is at point one, the teacher looks down to point four and over to point seven. They ask, what are they going to, what's happening here? Changes begin. What do they need for changes to begin? And they look over here to four or to two. Practices. What practices can I give this person that will help them develop the experiences and intention to get through the first shock? That's really important. At two, you're looking to what's the outcome? Non-dual awareness. That's what you want for your student. You don't want them to follow you. You don't want them to give you money. You don't want them to do anything other than to find this sense of non-dual awakening. Abiding non-dual awareness is, if there is a goal, this is the goal. You get through the shock at three. At four, you're looking practices and knowledge. You find the practices and knowledge that help the changes to begin. You as the teacher are looking to those points. Here is the first really hard thing, which is to get from four to five. Giving up the honeymoon and getting into the work. The real work is here, done at five, the dark night of the soul. And once you pass the equator, you can't successfully undo this. You can't uncook the meal. And in this case, you are the meal. You can become a rigid fundamentalist at this point and bust the process. But there is a big price to pay if you get here. The teacher is looking at you here and going unconditioned self, non-dual awareness, got to give him the skills to open up to grace and to encourage her to do this at this point. This happens, boom, the student is here. This is the important line. The student 
becomes the teacher. The student now moves back to this point to do their next line of work, even though they are touching on eight and nine and nine moves you to a different point of one as this new Enneagram starts. But the important thing here is that at this point of unconditioned self, the student is invited to teach. And there's a lot of different ways to say that. That's the term invited to teach, I think is I got that from the Zen guys. And I really like it because that's what you're supposed to do. You see a student moving through that and you say, please come sit with me and help me teach these people. Because the fact of the matter is when you have hit this point, you are at the same level of consciousness as the highest Buddha who has ever existed. The most enlightened guy and you have the same consciousness at this point. And so you should be encouraged if you want to, to teach, but in, your path is gonna take you here back to one at some, in some way or another. Maybe you'll write a book. Maybe you will open up a hamburger stand in the middle of nowhere and interact with people in a really interesting way. Doesn't matter, but the student becomes the teacher. You are no longer the, the Jedi apprentice, you are the Jedi Knight. You'll have to go through a whole nother cycle to be a Jedi master, but that's a whole different story. But the purpose line here, the non-dual awareness hits and boom, there you have it. And I am going to stop the screen sharing so that I can look at y'all. So there it is. It's exciting. It's fun. It's the only game in town that's worth playing in my personal opinion. <laughs> All right. So we have another question from Ilmar. Yes. What is the difference between unconditioned self and non-dual awareness? Isn't the non-dual awareness what brings about the unconditioning? No, it's actually no. the other way around. The unconditioned self brings on the non-dual awareness in my experience. Because when you're at the unconditioned self, you're, you're tending to look inside. And when you're at the non-dual awareness, you're looking both inside and outside at the same time. How do you feel about that, Noor? Help us out here. Um, I mean, I, I think that's true. Like it's different from the initial like I was actually thinking to myself going through like, is, does that feel true? And I thought, well, with my initial experience of awakening, it was a little bit non-dual, but it was more like a, a falling apart. Whereas when I experienced actual deconditioning, that led to a more open sense of, um, connection and unification, non-dualness. So I, I do think there is a difference there. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, listening to Noor is better than listening to me because her experience <laughs> of this is uh, less far in the past. Yeah, there is that. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's, it's yeah. It seems so to me that even a glimpse of this, or even a, a toehold in this non-dual awareness, is kind of the, um, the the thing which dissolves some of the conditioning. You know? Not uh, necessarily, as opposed to the conditioning being dissolved by some exercise. So I mean, I think those are like two different approaches almost. One is you know you find some process or exercise to decondition. In the area, and the other one is sort of you know finding a solvent which naturally dissolves some of the conditioning. The experience of non-dual awareness, in and of itself, is not a solvent. I know this from personal experience. I had my first experience of non-dual awareness when I was about fourteen years old, and the problem with that, I mean, it was glorious. I was literally one with everything. Uh, and it lasted for a certain amount of time. 
and I was looking out the eyes of everything in the universe. I, whatever my, wherever my awareness was, it was shifting back and forth. I was looking through the eyes of the birds. I was looking through my own eyes. I was looking through the eyes of the trees that don't even have eyes. And then it stopped. Mm -hmm. What this did was make me want the experience more. And it put the experience in my past. And it was an impediment to my own development. It happened way too young. This should not happen to a 14 year old, in my humble opinion. It should not happen until you're maybe 25 or 26. Uh, in most cases, because you just don't have the awareness to deal with this. You don't have the chops yet. I sure as shit didn't have the chops. And so I spent some years going, I want to get back to that. I want to get back to that. And as long as I was focused on getting back to that and how great that was, I could never do it because you can't go into the past. And I, until I met the guy who said, you know, that experience is right here, right now in this instant. And you can't see it because you're looking way over there and it ain't there. There is no there there. And so the experience of non-dual awareness in and of itself is not a solvent in my experience mm -hmm. from my particular life path. It mm -hmm. can in some ways be the, the coagulant. In the sense of it almost creates a new set of conditioning. For yes. Me. Yeah, I mean, but this is... I, I wonder whether it doesn't dissolve some of your call on the lower level conditionings. I mean, are you still yeah, maybe, it, maybe it did, maybe it did. Hell, you know, but what it did was gave me a new fixation, mm -hmm. a new area of fixation, which I mean, in some ways it probably served me, but uh, it was not, I mean, the problem was there was no one in my life at that time, even though I had some really smart people in my life, really good people, there was no one could, who could say, you know, you can't hold on to that. You have to experience it and let it go because they didn't have that experience. And so I was stuck uh, for some years until I could find somebody who had had that experience and understood it and mm -hmm. could be a guide for me. Yeah. Well, that makes perfectly good sense. Yeah. But then that makes me dubious about, well, not maybe dubious, then wondering about your traveling line and going from, uh, you know, in that, that point of uh, uh, un unconditioned awareness, what the hell it was to being a teacher, right? I mean, it seems to me at that point, you're not but really- But I wasn't at seven. I wasn't at seven. I was at one or I was at zero at that point. That was my initial, what the heck is going on and how do I find it? But it was the experience of non-dual awareness. At seven, you get that experience through your work. You, you consciously get it. Mm. This happened to me through accident and hazard. I did not set myself up to do it. I kind of ran into it when I wasn't looking and there it was. This was the thing that said, there is something else out there and you have to find out what it is. That's what started my path. But I didn't get to seven for a, quite some years, probably not until my mid thirties. And so what was the difference in your, in your non, in your, in your awareness between when you were, I don't know how old you were, five or six, whenever you had it, and the fact that uh, when you finally got, got it as a result of your work. Because the first there time. Was, the difference in the actual experience? Yeah, the first time it was a state. Mm. My consciousness allowed me to, uh, was allowed to experience the state. So would you. Yeah, like, would you say the difference is the abidingness? You know how yes, we talk the about abidingness. And abiding non-dual awareness? Yeah, and the cleaning away of all of the shit. Yeah. That's important because it's like, if you were covered in shit and you put on the most beautiful clothes in the world, it's not the same as having taken a bath and cleaning the shit off yourself and putting on those clothes. 
the first state ruins the clothes. Yeah. And we see that in a lot of so-called yeah. groups. I mean, who, you know, might well have achieved some interesting states, but still have a lot of shit going yeah. on. Yeah, I mean, you have these guys who, you know, they can do amazing things. They, they produce magical candy and give it out to their followers who go, oh, wow, magical candy. He must be God. Or people who have drug trips that are world shaking, but they're not prepared for them and they don't have any resources to help them unpack that. They're just it's, it's almost like a premature experience. And we've talked about that in uh, our talk about the assumption of premature enlightenment. Yep. Like this is this is all kind of part of that as well. We're going to have to do a lot of video links. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, a story, well, uh, there's a guy by the name of Michael Harner, uh, Dr. Michael Harner, anthropologist. He was one of the guys who got the shamanic movement of the 19, late 70s, early 80s going. Uh, and he went down and hung out with the Hivero Indians in South America, and he did a lot of ayahuasca, or yopo as they call it. Um, and on one of his experiences with this, this teacher substance, he was blasted out into the universe where he met these giant dragon beings who said, we are the true masters of reality. And he was shaken by this to his very core. And when he finally returned from that experience, he went and found his, his teacher. And he said, I met the Hivero doesn't have a word for dragon. He said, I met these giant lizards with wings. And they said that they were the true masters of reality. And I'm like, what do I do now? And the, his teacher looked at him and said, oh, them, they always say that. And that's the thing you have to remember just because they always say that doesn't mean it's true. The trip is interesting, but it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. And you've also said uh, just because they're dead doesn't mean they're smart. Meaning yes, that if was you meet something that I was hanging up in my first school is that, yeah. that phrase for people who thought that they should follow channeled beings. Just because they're dead don't mean they're smart. So John has a question here. Yeah, John asks, what role is the universal energy slash, slash grace in the dawning of non-conditioned state as opposed to the practices? Well, you remember that talk that I did about uh, how you need a certain amount of energy in order to affect uh, permanent change? The, non, the universal energy and grace give you that last bit of energy. It's energy that you usually cannot collect on your own. It's an infusion. So Mustakim says. Uh, Mustakim says, so this Enneagram should not be used by someone who wants to map or build their own work slash path. No, you can use it. If it wasn't useful for that, I wouldn't be doing this. I think he's just uh, asking because we said before, like, if, if where you're at is none of your business, then how is this useful to you? Um, it will be really useful when you start teaching other people. Yeah. And it will, it will still be useful to you, even if it's none of your business, because you'll have an inkling of what you might need if you don't have somebody in your life who can prod you in the right direction. I mean, you could be working with Dave and he would say, you need this. But if you're not working with Dave, if you don't have somebody, you may have to tell yourself what you need. And the truth of the matter is, is that you can finish this path without a teacher. It's just really, really, really hard. And most people won't. And you're going to go in circles a bunch. Yeah. But just, this, idea, yeah. this idea that you must have a teacher is, in my experience, not totally true. It's incredibly useful if you find the right teacher and incredibly damaging 
if you find somebody who is actually uh, a fraudulent teacher, somebody who has uh, put themselves in a place that they aren't actually at. And it's really hard to determine which is which, but this Enneagram can be a tool to help you determine that. I think it's mostly a matter of not, as we say, identifying with where you're sitting. Yep. You just have to keep moving through the spirals. If you want to, if you really are serious about awakening and maturing and growing, then getting attached to some point on this, this Enneagram on the path in general is going to be counter to that. Uh, John asks, what is it that comes from the outside at the first shock? Uh, what comes from the outside is usually direction. You have to grab hold of that direction with your own will at that point. So the nine shock is the passive shock. The Three shock is the active shock. And the six shock is the reconciling shock. And for those of you who have studied um, in the six worlds, you'll understand what that means. If you haven't studied that, you won't understand, but eventually we're going to have that put together as something that y'all can get your hands on and study and then you'll understand. There are six processes at the base of the universe. They are floating around in the lake of Mimir at the roots of the world tree or something like that. They exist at a very sure. fundamental reality. Uh, and if you understand them, you understand how things go together. If you don't understand them, it's okay. The world does what it does, whether you know or not. I want to just say something. I found that the three points, what was helpful for me was having a prototype as in meeting someone who had gone through something where I hadn't come. So seeing that, then from inside myself, it was like, I'm going to do something like that no matter what. It won't be the same as that person, but I'm going to do it. Like, is that a thing that you can do? Yes, that that's point? exactly correct. What he said. He just said it better than I could come up with saying it. So listen to him. Don't listen to me. Um, that's exactly right. And I'm, I'm assuming that we're thinking of the same person when you, when you talk about that. And yeah, I mean, that's like a glimpse into uh, the void that looks back at you. And either you are going to be terrified by it or you were going to be drawn to it, or you're going to be terrified by it and drawn to it. The latter sounds awfully familiar to me. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, so Zainab asks, can the student be stuck on seven or is the universal energy what needs what leads the student to move forwards on 2.8 and nine? That's a good question. And I don't know that I have an exact answer on it. My, my initial intuition is that yes, the student can be stuck for a time at seven where they don't want to finish the, the line. They don't want to go back and clean up the kitchen. But I don't think that it will last forever in most cases. But that's a really good question. I'm going to have to ponder that. Hmm. Palon, what do you think? What's coming up for you? Uh, since right now I'm marinating in like product development and things and like thinking about work stuff. Um, getting, using the Enneagram to say that, oh, there's a seven and there's an eight to me reminds me of like 
in the valley we say okrs right objectives and key key results whereas like this thing that i want to get to but what you were saying which is just don't worry about that just work just do the work just think about the process just just work through the process because the work and the process they are the generating functions for what you want to get to like you know how like when i do a bagua with you like if i think about this thing that I, this movement I want, then usually I can't do it. But if I just think about relaxing, which is part of the process to get to the mm -hmm. result I want, then I get to the result I want without freaking out about it. So that's what that kind of reminded me of. Yeah, and that's why I keep you around as a student because you have those realizations. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Jonathan, what do you think? I think currently in where I feel I am in my life is I'm at stage four. It, I've been on a, some kind of path since I've been a, a young man, but I never really felt that I crossed the first shock, not in a big way, until about a year ago. And I think what got me to the point of crossing that first shock was getting over five years of sickness. And that really knocked my ego big time. That'll do it. Yeah. yeah. And from that point, I started picking books up and reading very seriously and joining a Gershif group and getting help. And now I'm getting the fruits, those those honeymoon fruits, the easy yeah, pickings. We love those. Fruit, That's like the, the best thing. The fruits that dropped have dropped off the tree and just need to be gathered. But I'm not up to the stage five where I have to start climbing and doing the serious work to get at the, the other fruits in the high branches. But you know what? Now that you have put in your common consciousness, as Mr. G used to say, the idea that that must happen, you will move inevitably towards it. How surprising uh, is that? Yeah, I might be across the equator. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure yet. Well, mm -hmm. you won't know until it's too late. <laughs> But you have help. If you're still a member of a, a, a good group that has somebody who knows what they're doing, you have that. You can, you're always welcome to hang out here. Uh, yeah, I want to make sure that we share that, yeah. Yeah, we like you. We want you yeah. to stick around as much as you want. As much as you want, yeah. yeah. So thank, thank you for you. sharing that, yeah. Big things like that can certainly shake us up and to some degree wake us up. So I'm not surprised to hear that five years of illness was a big part of that for you. Yeah. Yeah, the wonderful thing about illness is it can teach you how to surrender. I think depression was a big part of that for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Zainab, what do you think? Um, no question. <laughs> Any answers? Oh, good. Any thoughts, though? <laughs> Truth of the matter is, Zainab, I like your answers even better than I like your questions. I like both. Both are good. I also like how comfy you look. Is it hot there? Humid? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love seeing the, uh, the drawing, the painting emerge behind you. Every time I, I see you, it looks more complete. I was actually putting it on the Enneagram today. Yeah. Were you? 
Awesome. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Mr. Keem, what do you think? No, I, I think I I don't have any more question yet. Yeah, you had some good ones though. Yeah. And it's it's noting to me that I think this this idea of universal energy, God, whatever we want to call it for our placeholder word is is a sticky topic for some. And I get that. Yeah, it's just the one that I have the hardest time figuring out how to talk about. Oh, I know. It's hard. What do you think, Sheree? Sorry about that phone call, but I forgot I wasn't unmuted, but I just received a phone call from my mother ah. to say that an uncle, um, we're related by through marriage. He just died on the 6th of December, but his mm -hmm. wife that he was looking after died yesterday. So oh, wow. two weeks. So mother and father have died. And uh, yeah, it, well, their suffering has ended because they mm -hmm. were both very, very, very sick. But uh, just a few weeks, a month ago, we were having this meeting. I got a phone call. Another uncle had died, lung cancer. So it was just like, they're just coming one mm -hmm. after the other. If there's anything more compelling than death, <laughs> it's yeah. Just, yeah, it just floors you because you just think, well, you know, um, is it your mind creating this suffering or you? Mm. Pain is objective, suffering is subjective. That's my experience of it. And the universe arranged for my body to be um, to to have some weird problems, and one of them is that I don't process calcium correctly or normally, and so I am very very prone to kidney stones. I started getting kidney stones when I was 16 years old, and I have probably passed a hundred kidney stones or more in my lifetime. So that has taught me about pain and suffering. Pain is there. Pain hurts. Pain is no fun. If I hold on to the pain, I suffer. If I let the pain pass through me, I don't suffer. Even if the pain is agonizing. And trust me, kidney stones can be really agonizing. But they, you don't have to suffer with them, if that makes sense. And morphine is your friend. Yep. So do we have any last thoughts? Yeah, we've run kind of late on this. Yeah, we have. Thanks for putting up with us, guys. Yeah. I guess I'd, I'd still like to hear some more about the surrendering to universal energy. I guess what I'd like to is sort of like a, a phenomenological description of that. I mean, oh, sure. it sounds the closest thing it sounds to me is letting, stepping out of identification with a particular ego role, right? I mean, that seems to be, a, but that's that's an iterative process, you know. I mean, you step out of one, and there's another one, and so, uh, but I guess I'm I, I'm having a tough time grasping. For me, it is the process of dissolving. Dissolving what? Exactly. <laughs> Imagine you are an ice cube and somebody drops you, the ice cube, into the ocean. The ice cube is still there, but it dissolves into the ocean. And all of a sudden you are the ice cube and the ocean. And if you go far enough, you're just the ocean. And there is no you to just be the ocean. There is just ocean. Right. And, and but what seems to be criti critical, at least to your account of that point, is that there's an act of surrendering that you presumably, from your ego point of view, are taking in order to 
allow yourself to dissolve, right? Yeah, and it's and the what sense of- that, What is that step that you're taking at that point? That is the step of, of knowing that you can experience this universal if you just let your ego go. It's the, it is allowing at least momentarily your ego to die. Which is why it's oftentimes called annihilation. Fana, fana, uh, fana finafs, the, the, the ego's annihilation. They say, when you experience the divine unity, your ego is dissolved because it cannot hold together against the force of that. And then the divine unity gives you a new ego, one that does not have all of the crap attached to it because you need an ego to exist on this, this plane of reality. You cannot exist in this world that we are all talking in right now without an ego. If you try, the body dies. It's your ego that keeps you from walking into the, uh, into the middle of a freeway and standing there because you have a better view of the mountain. Right, well, granted, granted that. I mean, I, I think there's no argument about that. Uh, I guess, but it seems to me that to intentionally surrender is an egoic act. It's almost like it has to, it seems like it have to happen to you rather than something that Maybe. you- The intend. only way that you will ever know, Ilmar, is if you do it and then report back. Okay, I'm, I'm asking you to report upon your experience, but that's yeah. fine. And I, I am reporting upon my experience, yeah. but yeah. you're never going to understand everything that I'm saying. Okay. Cool enough. Okay. Yeah. As uh, John says, who tastes knows, perhaps, not just yep. perhaps. I mean, that's yep. true. Yeah. I, I, I almost feel like, yeah, you, you choose to step into it. But at that moment, it's, it's simultaneously not about you at all. You're stepping into something outside of yourself or, or both within and beyond you. And at that point, it gets very esoteric. And that's why it's so hard to talk about this in a verbal way. And some people speak of it as a grace in some sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we've yeah. used that word here, like it's, it's being given to you. Yeah. And I think um, we talk about it being something that comes from the outside to you and i think this is just the language we're using for that interface between the egoic self and this larger universal beingness and how do we talk about that interface does that interface even exist i mean frankly no but like i said that's where you're getting esoteric and weird. So, yeah. hey, Palan, can you quote for me the first lines of the Tao Te Ching? Well, the Dao Ke Dao Fei Chang Dao. Basically, it's a bunch of different ways to say it, but it, it really is. It has to be experienced for oneself. It really cannot be communicated by another, and and have that information actually transfer completely. It really has yep. to be. Yep. And that's the thing. Is, uh, to be a teacher is to trick your students into experiencing it for themselves. Yeah, to take subjectivities and, you know, deconstruct them kind of in a playful way. Yeah. And when you, when you do that, you come back to your teacher and you go, oh, and your teacher goes, yeah. <laughs> Duh. And then that's that, pretty yeah. much. This is uh, my friend Lawrence. He and I have this conversation on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't say it. You, you can only experience it. You can't transmit it to somebody who has not had the experience. And when they have had the experience, no words are necessary. And it's one of the reasons I like to, to talk with Larry is that 
I can just sit there and feel the void radiating through him. And it's kind of cool. I like it. It's relaxing, soothing. Stuff to chew on. Stuff to chew on. We should probably wrap it up because it's getting late. Oh, yeah. But this was fun. This was fun. We did good. You guys did good. None of this would happen without the feedback of all of you. And I'm going to come over here and switch it back to gallery view so we can Yay. see everybody. Yay. There's everybody. Pretty bunch mode. Yeah. You guys are what make this possible. The teaching is not given by Noor and myself. It is created by the field of all of us working together. And that's an important thing to remember. Agreed. Yeah. So any last thoughts before we sign off? I have one. Yeah. Yeah, I want to wish everyone happy holidays. It is that time. It is that time. It is the time where the darkest of the dark comes to us and we pass through it back into the light mm -hmm. in whatever way that we want to think about it. Yep, solstices, whether it's the winter or the summer for you. May it be a point of contemplation. All right, well, then everybody wave because I'm going to shut off the recording. Thank you for being here. You're all wonderful. Everybody who's watching this is wonderful, except for the people who give us trolling Thumbs comments. Down. Um, they're not wonderful, and, but we agree. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and happy holidays to you as well, John, and to everyone else. Hope you have a great new year. I think we are not going to have a talk next week. Nope, there right? will be no talk next week because yes. we're going to be celebrating something or other we're going to take a little holiday and we encourage all of you to take an opportunity and do the same and we will see you the following yeah. sunday yeah take care folks all right bye everyone